Hi everybody, I just wanted to make this video to go over some of the things in this um, review packet. We're going to talk about graphing data tables and then also scientific method. So as we can see here, the data tables are used to organize and visualize data. So here's our data table down here at the bottom. This data table is organizing the information based on time and water temperature. And as we can see, each column should be titled and include the units of measurement. So we have this column here on the left, which is time. And then we have a column here on the right, which is temperature. So as we can see, we have two bits or two groups of data that we have collected in this experiment. In the data table, or the data table must be arranged in an increasing or decreasing fashion. So this way the numbers make sense. So we can obviously take a look, analyze, and then come to our conclusions. Now, when we use a data table, typically we will use it to represent or create a graphic representation um, when we create a line graph or a bar graph. So there's a couple things that we need to know. First of all, when we take a look at a graph, we have to be able to identify what's called the independent variable and the dependent variable. So a nice easy way to understand or identify which is the independent variable and the dependent va variable is the following. One trick I like to use, the x-axis is always the independent variable. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put the word or the letters I and D underneath the x-axis. And this, this way I can fit it nice and neatly underneath there. So that's how I can remember that the independent variable is on the x. And then on the y-axis, I tend to draw a really long lowercase d, EP, for dependent. So that's how I'm able to identify those two factors by looking at a graph. With that known, um, I can correctly title my axes as needed. Okay? In our data table here, typically your independent variable is going to be all the way to the left, and then the right-sided columns would be your dependent variables. And we'll talk about the difference between those two in a little bit. Okay? So that's how you can organize your graph and get your axes titled and labeled. Now, when we take a look at setting up our graph, there are a couple things you have to remember. First of all, when you go up on the x-axis or the y-axis, the numbers must increase by constant amount. Constant amount means they have to increase by the same amount. So for example, if you're going to go up by ones, you would use ones. If you're going, going to go up by twos, you would use twos, fives, tens, and so forth. If we take a look at our graphic example here, we see that our numbers go up by the same amount at 25 each time. So this would be 25, 50, 75, 100, 125, 150, 175, 200, and it continues that way all the way up the graph. So long as my intervals are equal and constant, my graph is going to be just fine. The second thing that you must remember is when you set up the labels, your numbers must line up with the grid lines. Sometimes kids like to put the numbers next to the box. Notice how my numbers are all lined up next to a grid line. I don't have them floating somewhere in the middle of a box on this axis. So please make sure that your numbers line up with the lines. And, as, and just keep in mind, you don't have to always start with zero when you start numbering your axis. Okay, some kids do, but you don't have to. Now, when we do graphs on the regions, you can have one or two different types. You can have a line graph, which could be a single line graph, or maybe a double, where you have two data sets to plot, plot. Or you can have a bar graph. A bar graph simply looks like this. If this is my y-axis, this is my x-axis, your bar graph would just be a graph with different bars on them showing you the different data sets of your experiment that you are graphing. So those are your basics about graphs, okay? Oh, one more thing about the graphs. When you do your title, your title has a particular form to it, and if you stick with this simple little formula, you should be able to get a good title in your graph every single time. All right, so the, graph, uh, the title of the graph has to tell what the reader is looking at. So when we write a graph or write a title for a graph, that's the point of the title. So when we do the title, you have to remember your independent variable is the first thing that's written.
followed by your dependent variable. Sorry for the misspelling. So if we take a look at our dependent and independent variables, our graph title is going to read the effect of time on, and our dependent variable is water temperature. And that's how you write a graph title. So again, you can get that information from the data table, or you can get that dependent independent variable information from the graph. Okay, so that's graphing and data tables. Let's take a look at the scientific method. All right, so our scientific method has different parts to it that we have to keep in mind. So again, when we have our title here, we want to include or make sure we include our independent variable. and our dependent variable. Whatever they may be. So we would put those into those slots there to make up our title. Our hypothesis is an educated guess. And when we write that, typically, technically, we're supposed to write it as an if-then statement. Sometimes on the region cell, they'll just write it as a statement of something affecting another thing. They may not write it as an if-then. So, for example, let's just use um, a hypothesis just to talk about this. Um, so let's say if fertilizer is used then plants will grow taller. And we'll use this example to break down the different parts of our scientific method here. All right, so this is our hypothesis. And as you can see, it's characterized by an if and a then. So there's our if-then statement. One thing to remember is when you write your um, hypothesis, your hypothesis has a particular structure to it, just like your independent variable, uh, sorry, like your titles do. Typically, your independent variable is going to be the first part of your title and then the dependent. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's our hypothesis. If fertilizer is used, then plants will grow taller. And then this is something that can either be supported or refuted. Okay, refuted means proven wrong. Because hypotheses don't always have to be correct. They are just educated guesses. Next, our control groups. So when you have, a, when you have a, an experiment, you remember you're only testing for one variable. When you do that, you're going to have your control group, which is the group that's getting normal treatment. So I'm going to cross out this example here to fit our example that we're working on. In our experiment, the control group would be the one that is not getting fertilizer. So if we were setting up potted plants, this would be the group that we would just give regular soil, water, sunlight, but no extra fertilizer to. Our experimental group is the group that's getting the treatment. This is the group that we are testing. This is our test group. So they would be the ones that would get fertilizer. Okay, because we are experimenting on them. So that's an easy way to kind of remember who gets the independent variable is which group are we experimenting with. All right, so those are our two groups, the control group and then the experimental group. The good function or the good reason to have a control group is you can compare what the experimental group uh, does in relation or reference to the control group. If these guys grow taller than the control group, then we know the fertilizer works. If they don't grow taller than the control group, then we know the fertilizer does not work. Now we have our independent and dependent variables that we, as we were talking about. The independent variable is the thing you are testing. This is the variable that we are testing.
So what we are testing is the use of fertilizer. So that's going to be our independent variable here. Now, in our experiment, giving fertilizer, something is going to depend on that. Something is going to happen as a result of that. That is called our dependent variable. And as we said, if the fertilizer is used, then the plants grow, will grow taller. So the part or the dependent variable here is going to be plant growth. Because the growth of the plant depends on whether the fertilizer is used or not. So here are a couple things that you can kind of remember to help you identify, again, the independent variable or dependent variable. One, what is the student usually in the question going to test to see the effect of? Or a couple of things. It is the thing that the independent variable starts with I. So it's the thing that I am testing. So you can remember it that way. Or if you get a hypothesis, the independent variable starts with an I and it's the if part. And if starts with the letter I here. The dependent variable, remember, is the data that you are collecting. So the D in dependent is the same as the D in data. Or you can ask, or take a look, I'm sorry, you can take a look at the then part of your hypothesis. So if we take a look here, we will see that our hypothesis will have our independent variable in the front and our dependent variable at the end. All right. Now, if they ask you how to increase the validity or reliability or how legitimate or legit your results are in an experiment, there's some things that you can add or write down that will be correct answers. Like one, you can repeat the experiment. If it is repeated and you get the same results over and over again, then that's a reliable experiment. Okay. Or you can increase the sample size, which is the number of subjects, test subjects. So if you have 100 plants that grow better with fertilizer versus one plant, those 100 plants would be a better data set to prove your hypothesis that if fertilizer is used, then plants will grow. So we can do that, or you can repeat it over a number of trials. You can increase the number of trials. So if you have one plant growing with fertilizer versus one that is not, and you do that 100 times, and then the plant with the fertilizer grows faster all the time, or grows taller, then you have a much more reliable experiment and conclusion to come, uh, to come up with. Okay, so that's graphing data and the scientific method.